business and love and forgiveness. I'm just not sure that works. How are you going to do that, Chris? Well, I would submit to you that it's already been demonstrated. We are here in the name of the people that uh, we're here, and the reason we're here is because of the Fetzer Institute. John Fetzer was many things. He could have been on any of the councils who are represented here today. He was an amazing person. But I think very much the reason why we're here today in his name is that he was a very successful businessman. And he left his wealth and entrusted it to the trustees of the Fetzer um, Institute. I'd also want to say that the reason we're here is really to talk about dreams. John Fetzer's dream and other successful business people have had dreams too. Walt Disney was an incredible business person too. And he said, if you can dream it, you can do it. Marianne Rodmacher said, stand often in the company of dreamers because they believe you can do impossible things. Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. We have a dream in the business council, business professions council. We think that business has the capacity to truly change the world. I mean, if you think about it, it is business that creates the wealth in the world that, that gives us the opportunity to be able to take care of those who need it. And that, I think, and we believe as a council, is our responsibility. Any one of the council members who is here is passionate and could stand up here and talk to you about the specifics of our program. But we selected one individual who we think really exemplifies love and forgiveness. He, in a major corporation, as the chairman of the Foundation for Sustainable Development, has done amazing things around the world. It is my pleasure to introduce Herr Klaus Leisinger. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Let me tell you, one and, a half, one and a half years ago, I got a telephone call from Lee Tavis. You know him in the meantime. He was then much younger than now, one and a half years. And uh, he asked me, Klaus, would you want to join me in working for the Fetzer Institute on Love and Forgiveness in the Business Professions? I didn't know the Fetzer Institute. And I thought, love and forgiveness in the business profession? Wrong movie. <laughs> so uh, I love Lee like a brother, and I appreciate his brain. So I thought, you know, he must have his reasons. And then we started. And uh, all I can tell you, it's still something that is mind-boggling. Love and forgiveness are attitudes, are virtues that you apply in your family, with your spouse, with your children, with your loved ones. But in business, with your competitors, under time pressure, under resource pressure, we could probably talk half a year on that. But again, as with every good thing, you can explain it in six minutes. You can make love and forgiveness part of your business if you do not have a schism in your values, if you do not apply different values in your role as a father, as a spouse, as a friend, different from what you do in your business sphere. If you don't have a schizophrenic mind, that's good for me and for my family, but then I have a job to do and there are different things that are important. Secondly, if you don't look at business as an isolated objective in itself. We heard a lot when I looked at this health uh, um, event earlier, you know, what is equity? What is equity for a pharmaceutical corporation? Part of it is differential pricing, that you charge the poor people in Africa or Asia different prices than the rich consumers. But then, aren't there poor people in the United States or Germany? Very difficult task. And yet, if you look at business as an isolated thing, you will always do different things than if you have a holistic approach. Now, Business, well, you all know, Friedman, the business of business is business, and yes, the most important part to well-being, the most important part to creating value, to widening choices, is business with integrity in your core competence. That's where we in business have a competitive advantage. But then, if you devote part of your time, part of your skills, part of your resources, to things that are not expected to yield a profit in the next quarter, and if you devote part of yourself and of your resources to other things, 
that might be worthwhile too. I give you a story about leprosy. We started to work in leprosy about 28 years ago. We then had about 9 million leprosy patients in the world. Today we are down at 220,000, a different job, a different challenge. But the point is, if you look at that woman, that is a woman that I know since more than 20 years. She doesn't have limbs anymore, she doesn't have hands anymore, and she's blind since 20 years. And yet she's a person like you and me. She has a soul, she wants to be touched, she wants to be taken serious, she looks for dignity. And if you look at it from the outskirts, it's not, it doesn't look like dignity. It, is, it looks terrible. Leprosy is a disease that starts with discolorated spots on your skin. And if you diagnose it then and there, you can cure it then and there, and nothing will ever happen. So if you find them early, if you diagnose them correctly, if they accept the, the, the diagnosis, if they take the therapy, it's done. We give away all the drugs that are necessary to cure leprosy all over the world, and we have cured more than five million patients over the past years. The issue, thank you. The issue is leprosy is a disease that, all, that destroys the, para, the, the, para, the, uh, the nerves in the hand, the nerves in the eyes, the nerves in the nose. And uh, mostly women, uh, if they take the hot pot from the fire, they burn their hands, but they don't feel it. And they go on working and they get infections and they lose eventually their hands. The same if they work barefoot, bare, barefoot uh, they cut their feet, and this is how it all starts. All is avoidable. All are secondary infections of leprosy, and uh, leprosy could start, it starts like this, and that girl being treated early will be the most beautiful girl of India because she has been treated and she deserves to be treated. Now, you don't make money on pro bono issues by definition, and yet you get a different kind of reward. Let me share something with you. Three weeks ago, I had the opportunity to take the Novartis board of directors to one of my leprosy hospitals in Ifakara, Tanzania, and uh, some things you don't have to explain if people see it. You have to feel poverty, you have to smell poverty, you have to see poverty, you have to look into these people's eye, and then the question, should we do that or should we not do that, disappears immediately. And some of the most, of most hard-nosed managers reacted with the most natural human reaction, they started to cry. And it's not that you grab them there and ask them for money. That lesson is something that stays. Another lesson that is important is stakeholder dialogues. There are so many requests, so many demands from so many different people who all of them think their stake is the simple most important one in the world. And they come to you because they think you have dollar signs in your eyes and they ask for money and they ask you to support this and to, to support that and the fact is you cannot fulfill all the requests but what you should do is talk. My grandmother always told me, Klaus, God has given you two eyes at two ears and only one mouth. Act accordingly. <coughs> I forget that once in a while. But <laughs> the point is uh, listening to different stakeholders, li listening to different values, li to di li listening to different worldviews changes yourself. All of a sudden you begin to understand things that you wouldn't understand if you stay in your professional silo. Tolerate ambiguity. There are people who have a totally different attitude towards business. For a lot, if I work in the United Nations, I'm usually playing the Sheriff of Nottingham role. They are the uh, Robin Hoods. Uh, the point is, we are one world, we breathe one air, and uh, the better, the more we talk to each other and the more we understand each other, the more we are able to put resources, skills, and experiences together and make a better solution. Listen to those who do not have the political power and the economic weight to be listened to naturally. There are a lot of people, especially around the project that we have, where you look at them and say, Jesus, you know, go around them because it might be dangerous to talk to, to them directly. They all have their stories. We have seen it this morning. It's kind, these people live in a different kind of prison. It's the poverty systems prison that makes their life very difficult. And then you can bring 
Love and forgiveness into your business by minding about people who depend on you. These are people who queue up for a job. There are so many people who have you look for work, and there are so, so few jobs that you can offer. And yet, what is fair towards them? We take out once a year Trisomy 21 patients for a whole day. We pick them at their houses, and uh, we bring them to a place which they choose. At the beginning, a lot of people said, come on, give me a break, why should we do that? All of them coming back in the evening, we all of felt enriched in a different way. It's not only because they are lovable people, they are big children, they are nice people. It is also bringing home the message how lucky you are if you are healthy, if you are born at the right time, at the right place, and that's not something we deserve, that's something that has been given to us. Now, apply standards to those who work for you. If one of you takes the time and goes to the website and goes through the Human Rights, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and read the 27 paragraphs that you find there, start reflecting on it. That was probably the, li the, the, the wife of, that was Eleanor Roosevelt, probably writing three thirds of that as a person and then giving it to others a very strong document, and a document that has been accepted by 180 states in the world, so it's a common bond, it's a common value. But then, the longest trip starts with the first step, and the first step is always ourselves. And that, starting to integrate love and forgiveness into businesses, be honest, even if speaking up is difficult, be compassionate, even if ridiculed, Try to love those who do their best to be unlovable, and I'm sure all of us know some of them. Stay yourself and stay self-critical. If you are in power, if you are powerful, people are different to you than if you are powerless. And if people around you tell you, you are the greatest managerial genius in the world and the most holistic personality, don't try to walk on water on Sunday morning just believe if it's too good to be true, it usually is. Now, make love and forgiveness part of business. It's not a project that you start and that you end. It is a process, and it's a never-ending process. And it can be done. And let me quote here, Gandhi, you must be the change you want to see in the world, because if you are that change, it will go on as long as you have a chance. Now, we will show you a video now that shows you other examples from members of our advisory council that will prove the concept, yes, despite it being at the beginning difficult to understand, it is possible to integrate love and forgiveness in business. Thank you. Gandhi once said that there's plenty in this world to satisfy mankind's need, but not his greed. You won't find the words love and forgiveness in many boardrooms around the world, but there are many businesses from social entrepreneurs to major corporations who are exemplifying compassion and love and forgiveness. We hold these up for everyone to be able to learn from, and we ask for everyone in the business world to join this effort because it really is going to be the only way that our world will survive. There's almost a billion illiterate people on the planet today, one-seventh of the world's population. Every single study on illiteracy directly links it to problems of women's health, environmental degradation, poverty, the list goes on and on and on. We felt that the key to breaking the cycle of poverty really starts with being literate. And we decided to create a for-profit business that was fundamentally going to change people's lives, including our own. We put a for-profit company together, collected millions of books from a variety of different sources, sold them on the internet. We've now become the third largest online seller of used books in the world. In doing this, we created a triple bottom line company. We created a organization here that cares much more than just the single threaded focus on profit. And every time a book sells, we take a percentage of the sale price, not the profit, the actual sales price, 
and it funds hundreds of literacy organizations around the world. But more importantly than that, we've made a difference in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who never had a book, never had somebody read to them, never had an opportunity to become literate. But at the end of the day, this really comes down to how we're making a difference in the life of a child, an adult, who's never been able to read. Whether it's on the streets of Los Angeles or in Africa, Better World Books is there. Federal Books is providing a means of hope and inspiration, one book at a time, one child at a time. I have a home in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And there's a path that goes all the way around the lake. And I wanted the path by my property to be very special. I started out as a waitress. I was a single mom, no education but I had core beliefs of love and forgiveness and service. I eventually went on to open up my own company. Little did I know at that time that those three basic principles that I learned as a waitress would make my company, New Age Transportation, explode with great profits, tremendous customers. Through the good fortune, of what has come through my company. We have been able to do so many wonderful things. We started the Expect a Miracle Foundation helping thousands of children of single parents. We've been able to help people of Katrina. We've been able to help the soldiers in Iraq. The Believe Project, this is what happened. I was at a school, I was at my granddaughter's school, and there was a woman in front of me as we were waiting in line who was telling this complete stranger that her daughter had died and she now had her granddaughter to raise. And meanwhile, here's my granddaughter. She's coming up, Grandma, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And so I said, all right, take, just get three things. Well, now her granddaughter came, and she said, Grandma, I think I've got enough for the $15. I've got a pen, I've got this, I've got that. And I wanted so badly to say, let me buy that for you. Let me do it, and I didn't have the courage. So it hit me, wow. We need to start this project, and we called it the Believe Project. So we put $100 in an envelope with all these motivational cards. So when you're in a situation like that, where you see, I really want to help, but I don't have the courage, you could certainly give them the envelope. Ma'am, uh -huh. there's a very nice woman who'd like you to have this, okay? It's $100. Oh. Thank you. You're welcome. How could you not have an experience like that and say, okay, but we got to give out more? Because I believe the more you give, the more you're going to get. When I bought this home and I put inspirational messages on a fence. I had no idea 
that 18,000 people were going to show up and leave a piece of themselves here on this path. Ring that bell. Miracles do happen. Miracles can happen to anybody. When a disabled youth is born in a poor family, in a village in India, this means a life of suffering and great despair. You don't have any future. You live dependent life for the rest of your life. And because you are not a wage earner to support the family, um, you are an extra mouth to feed. So in some respects, you are given a life sentence with no future at all. Mirash and I decided to do something about it and she created Youth for Jobs for that purpose. What we do is locate disabled boys and girls in the villages. We talk to them, we talk to their parents and we actually tell them what is possible. We bring them to Hyderabad and enroll them into a database of unemployed youth. This group of people are the most disadvantaged of the disadvantaged. The most vulnerable among the poor. And yet, they have abilities. We train them and we give them jobs. We ask companies to hire our youth, not out of pity, but because it makes business sense. Parents cannot believe that their disabled boy and girl, whom they thought was useless, can actually get a quality job. These are very good employees. They work harder, productivity is greater, and attrition is also less. What Meera Shanai is doing is coming out of her heart, out of her commitment, to not let the suffering that she saw to spread. In her own way, she is manifesting love. So it's actually a win-win for all. A win-win for the youth, because it means he's no longer languishing at the village unemployed. A win-win for the company, because they get a loyal, dedicated workforce. And for the family, because the youth is now sending back a part of his savings home. It's a win-win for us, because we are doing work which we believe in, and work which transforms suffering into great joy. The world is calling out and needs help. And we believe that business can be the real driving force in addressing these concerns. What society is saying is, love me and mine, and engage me and mine. I want you to reflect me, because underneath all of this is love and forgiveness. When I think of it, there is no more powerful force in the world that has the potential to do good than business. Business creates the wealth of the world. Can you imagine what would happen 
if, if all of business will respond to this call of love from society. If all of business would take this on, can you imagine how we could change the world? To quote Lee, imagine a world where business really can transform the world. This is our dream with the Business Professions Council, and I will tell you, this is our commitment. Thank you very much for your attention, okay? Thank you.